Well, 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 Saturday, April 6th, it's noon Eastern time. I'm Bob Harris. It's time for the weekly Ask Me Anything live stream. But before we get to the questions, I know you'll have some. There's a lot going on, right? Footballguys.com is the website. I appreciate you joining me here every Saturday at this time. Also on Wednesday, 7 p.m. Eastern time for the On the Hot Seat live streams. Matt Waldman joined us last week. Uh, many of you have already seen it. You can watch it again. Over and over. A lot of good information in there. Uh, if you're trying to catch up with the rookie class, there's no better way than listening to Matt Waldman talk uh, about his product, the rookie scouting portfolio. Get it at mattwaldman.com. Otherwise, hit the subscribe button, the notification bell, if you previously completed the YouTube-ish tasks uh, just outlined. Go ahead and hit the like button. Feel free to dislike me as well. I appreciate all the attention I can get, good or bad. Well, good to see everyone. Hello, Brian Larkin. Nice to see you. Kubikus. Hmm. Mr. Scampers in the house. Michael Kubiak staring at me from upstairs. Andrea. Andrea's back in the house. Hope, how are you feeling, Andrea? Andrea, uh, having a little some procedures done. Fantastic to see you back. Hello, Dane. Good to see you. Uh, John Bonneville suggesting, is this going to be the longest 19 days of all time? It's going to be the hypedest 19 days of all time, no doubt. Um, man, that's how it gets. Although we've had some things to help us, you know, deflect a little attention. And not just Rasheed Rice. Hey, Kevin Payne. How you feeling, Andrea? Everything going good? Glad you can make it. Um, the Rushy Rice thing, by the way, was not the top story of the week, obviously. There are top stories. Uh, if you want to check everything out that I got going on, go to footballguys.com. My notebook will be out later this weekend. We'll talk about, preview some of those things uh, that I'll be talking about there. If you missed my or aren't familiar yet with my weekly top five headlines uh, that's going up on the Football Guys YouTube channel, go over there. You know the Football Guys channel is fantastic. Uh, <laughs> Wendy early in the house. Yes, I do have a bestie and I have it on good authority. It's you. Uh, uh yeah, obviously it's Dempsey. Oh no. Oh no. Mike Dempsey is very, going to be very irritated by all this. I will be on later with Mike Dempsey today from three to 5 PM Eastern time. Matt Waldman will be joining us there. If you didn't get enough Waldman on the show Wednesday night, you will get more. He's mid mount making the rounds as you can imagine. Um, but he will be on the show. We'll also be talking Saints and Colts uh, today with a couple of local uh, observers of the, those scenes to kind of help us sort through what some of the needs are and what some of the draft possibilities are. Uh, do we know when we'll be drafting? When are you guys dra Are you guys all in the same draft? Who's in the well, which draft? Game overboard. Are you guys drafting in LA? I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be drafting. I will be drafting in Dallas. I'm pretty sure. That's probably the plan. Drafted here last year was great. Community beer. Uh, Ryan Quinlan set all that up. It was fantastic. Uh, a great venue. Met some great people there. Uh, and I know they're, I guess they're going to do Houston too as well. So that's fantastic. That might limit some of the people coming to Dallas. Some of the Texas folks might go to Houston instead of Dallas. But uh, <clears throat> so I will be probably, probably in Dallas. I like to support local. Kevin Payne heading to Charlotte. John's name reminds him of the first car he knows. Yes. Is that a Pony Pontiac Bonneville? Is that, a, is that a Pontiac or something? I had a Pontiac Tempest is why I say this. Uh, all right. So, like, I buried the lead here. The the Rasheed Rice, Rice news. Like, I know I see a lot of ch chatter about it on Twitter. Go follow Drew Davenport at Drew Davenport FF on Twitter. For all the legal updates, he's fantastic at this, knows exactly what he's doing. Uh, he's a defense attorney as well. It's like super auction manager. But uh, go check out his timeline. And he breaks these things down in great detail, kind of lets you know where they stand. This is going to be an ongoing pro process for Rachel Rice. If you're out there right now trying to leverage the value of this and like trying to take advantage of it and say, oh, I'm going to be the smartest kid in the class, you don't know how it's going to play out. I don't know how it's going to play out. Right? It looks like it's heading in a, in a positive direction. So, you know, that's great news. So if you're a dynasty investor in Rishi Rice, you should not be taking any action. If you're out there, you know, I know my colleague at Football Guys, Dave Plugi, he's not wrong. You know, this is the time to buy. If someone's selling, yes, I'm buying. But I don't think it's time to be out there proactively trying to bust a move on this, you know, in the hopes that you land on the good side of the deal. Although it's looking more positive. I think, you know, as it looks increasingly positive, if there's a, a nervous Nelly in your group, yeah, go ahead and take advantage of that. Oh, no. Oh, well, let me lobby, Dame. You and Scamper should be attending Dallas, where the, all the cool kids will be. And I say all the cool kids because 
Uh, everyone's a kid to me. Um, so just putting in my two cents, they're going to have a lot of new places this year. So, um, damn, that's a shame that you can't make the trophy smack. I'll look forward to seeing you. We'll do dinner. All right. So then the big news, of course, this week is the Stephon Diggs trade to Houston. A lot of pieces of that. I discussed it pretty thoroughly. Dave Kluge at Football Guys did a great instant reaction on that. Sigmund Bloom dug a little deeper in, uh, in his This Week in NFL News. And I dug a little deeper on my weekly video. Again, if you haven't caught that, go over to the Football Guys YouTube channel. And by the way, there's some great stuff over there. I'm sure you're all aware. If you don't watch, I've been hitting the couch with Cecil with uh, Sigmund Bloom now for since he started doing it. I want to say many, many years. Um, also, Cecil Lammy and Sigmund doing the Audible, Kluge and Alfredo doing the show every um, in the afternoons. Great, great show, award winning show. Um, and also the Dynasty guys, Kevin Thompson, Kevin Coleman, uh, Jeff Bell, and uh, Christian Williams doing a great job with all that. And Jagger May and everybody doing a fantastic job on the video content. So go check all that out. John Bonneville, I traded Stroud in my Keeper League last year when I was chasing a trophy. Many regrets. Look, this is the clear-cut winner to me of this trade, right? CJ Stroud. You can sit here and, you know, I have questions about how the values are going to sort out for the receiving core because we don't know. But right now, we're paying the wrong prices for all three of those Houston receivers that we've been paying for. I've been getting uh, – Nico Collins hasn't made it out of the second round in, in any draft I've been in this year. That's probably going to change, right? If nothing else, and that doesn't mean, you know, he's not going to be very good, but he's not going to be a tail end wide receiver one or early wide receiver two anymore. And Stephon Diggs, he's been a value late second, early third to me. How are we going to look at Stephon Diggs? And I've talked about this in these live streams before. How will we look at Stephon Diggs, you know, a couple of years from now? Uh, are we going to look at, at the end of last year? It didn't go well. Like a Game, but you know, we not we all know it was a season long issue for him, and but still he was super productive. <laughs> you know, had plenty of matches, plenty of yards, all those things. Just wasn't high end. So to bring him into Houston where he will share. And John Bonneville has Nico the lowest of the three. I think you can make an argument for that. I kind of see where you're heading with you know Tank Dell having a little more specific role. Oh, look, Nico Nico can take the top off a of defense and get past run past defenders too. So. I mean, it seems like all those guys are kind of that guy, right? So I'm just kind of curious to see how it plays out. Um, but we're getting we're getting Tank Dell maybe third, fourth round. All those prices are going to drop. That's going to create value. And at some point, it's going to start becoming apparent. But right now, we're flying a little bit blind. So you're just going to have to take the value on all of them. CJ Stroud has been going as about quarterback six. Maybe that goes up a little bit. Maybe now even I will take him ahead of Anthony Richardson. Nah, probably not. Um, the uh, it's and then they remember they brought in Joe Mixon as well, who I think is a great overlooked piece of or what's going to be an overlooked piece of this offense. We can look back to last year, Devin Singletary. I mean, like, no offense to him, but not like a super high end talent, or nobody's considered him a super high end talent up to this point. Very capable, serviceable. He was, you know, over the last 10 games as the start of last season, he was more. He was close to running back on level production. That's the volume, right? They give the ball to one back. There. Joe Mixon is no longer a huge breakaway threat. Um, you know, that's the reason the Bengals are moving on from him. They felt their offense wasn't explosive. The team was down in the lower third of the league in breakaway run rate. And Joe Mixon was part of the reason why. And they wanted to get more explosive in that regard. So they made the move. I think in Houston, they don't need to be as explosive in the run because they're pretty damn explosive in the past, and they just got more so with Stephon Diggs coming on board. So um, Joe Mixon going right around running back 18, I think that's a great value for him as well. C.J. Stroud, if he moves up, I mean, you know, some of these guys are at or near their ceiling as is. I mean, yes, is there room to go from quarterback 6-7 to quarterback 1 or 2? Sure. Are we going to drop that? I, I guess that's the, the next question here. Uh, by the way, most bummed about this, probably nuking Dalton Schultz completely, and he seemed to be a super safe, unsexy tight end. He was one of those guys that was like a safety valve for me as well, right? Like if you missed out on that super high-end top tier, or maybe you take a chance on like one of them, you know, on Brock Bowers, so I think it's still a little bit of a chance, right? Or or you maybe go a little earlier than you should on TJ Hawkinson, not knowing what his timetable is for a turn. Um, 
totally understandable that Dalton Schultz, and, and part of the reason you could take maybe a chance is that the Dalton Schultz is going to be waiting there later. Who are some of the other guys? There was a handful of guys. I felt really like if you miss out on that super high end tier, a handful of guys, and Dalton Schultz was one of them that I felt okay with, right? Like I mean, I'm looking right now. So you get past, uh, I don't know, Brock Bowers is going nine, David Njoku 10, then Jake Ferguson, Dallas Goddard, Dalton Schultz, Cole Komet, Pat Fryer, Luke Musgrave, they're all in that same range, but Schultz is up in the high end of that range of guys that you can kind of like feel comfortable out if you miss out on one of the early guys. And uh, something I've noticed in drafts this year, Ingram, uh, like I've, I've just done that. I just got Ingram. I think he went as tight as seven in the last best ball I'm doing. Um, yeah, I mean, Higby last year was not. The joke is going 10 right now. And I think the concern is obvious for him, right? Like his, you know, the scoring, I, I should bring up the number because it is pertinent. Um, uh, do I have it really convenient? The, the, the points he scored, career points with, uh, with Deshaun Watson have not been great, right? Like you're looking at, at a, not a great number. Let me see if I can bring that up for you. Probably not as fast as I'd like, but I'll look for that. Um, let's see, Deshaun Watson. Where, 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 where? I did find it. So Njoku has averaged 18.6 fantasy points a game in the five games with Flacco last year. So a lot of us are drafting, or a lot of people early on were drafting on that, but he's averaged 9.0 points per game and 11 with Watson. Is it possible Watson improves and finally turns into the guy we, you know, he was in Houston, right? I mean, look, that's what we're all doing, right? We're waiting for Deshaun Watson to go back to that top five quarterback that we saw during his time as a Texan. I don't know if that guy still exists. And, you know, and I always said make the same lame joke about it, but I mean, we're all still waiting for 2013 uh, Josh Gordon too. And he's not coming back either. I don't know that, I don't know that I have a lot more reason to believe that that, previous version of Watson is coming back because I haven't seen it yet. There were some encouraging moments I thought last year he's going to stay healthy and maybe he can't, right? He's still a young man. I know there's been a lot going on. I do. I too love Njoku as a player. And I think he's like, I would rather have him than Jerry Judy at the moment. Still prefer Amari Cooper, but, but I mean, the differences was pretty, the differences were pretty staggering in what he produced uh, with Joe Flacco and what he's produced with Deshaun Watson. I think for the most part, it's interesting that he has dropped down a little bit to Dame's point. Um, usually, we only remember the last thing we see, right? The last thing we saw was David Njoku running amok, destroying opposing defenses and putting up monster points on a weekly basis. So uh, maybe people are rising up a little bit. But yeah, on the underdog, he's 10. Let's see what he is on best ball 10s. Maybe I should see how, how, many, how many leagues I'm on the clock in the best ball 10s while I'm at it. I'm good. I'm good. Don't you hate that when you like suddenly realize you're sitting there and you're doing many, many drafts, way too many drafts, more drafts than you should be doing this time of year. And, and, uh, and all of a sudden you go, Oh damn, I haven't checked my drafts since like late last night. See how many autos you got. No auto picks. I set up some auto picks in advance last night. Uh, we just need to know how to do with Jameis Winston. Fair point, John Bonneville. Fair point. So <clears throat> I think the, the fallout in Buffalo is we do not know yet of the Stephon Diggs trade. Josh Allen uh, talked about this and <laughs> Sleeper on April 1st. What the hell was that? League of record. Come on, Sleeper, do better. Like, one man's opinion here. I'm just going to go out, you know, on a little tangent here. I think we all should have quit April Fool's after Sports Illustrated got us all with the Sid Fitch story, right? Like, that was the last really good April Fool's joke. If you're not old enough to remember, Google it. A mythical picture, article by George Plimpton. It was fantastic. This guy wrote about this guy that was so just off the wall, nuts, and everyone bought it. And it was, I, I believe there was even like the first paragraph of the story, the first letter of each word spelled out April Fool's, and nobody caught on to it because it came in your mailbox. It was Sports Illustrated, damn it. Nobody had it. He played French horn. He threw 169 miles an hour. It was amazing. And and after that, everyone should have quit. And this is the thing, you know, on, you know, the, everyone wants to be cute and get something done. It's the social media world. And everyone's like, you know, I don't do, I don't play the April Fool's for this reason, right? It's just, there's 
there's enough going on in all our lives. We don't need the angst of people trying to fool us with their snarky little uh, jokes on April Fool's. So I know I'm doing no fine. But that's just, you know, I think in, you know, we're in a media world, especially if you're in the media world. Everyone else can go ahead and happily prank each other. But those of us who do this for a living probably should not uh, have that in our portfolio, the fooling of our audience. It's not ideal. Uh, but going back to the Stefan Diggs, so, you know, Josh, I mentioned this in my Football Guys video. Jason Wood does the projections over Football Guys. It's like a, once they took a, a point off the touchdown numbers, uh, some points off the per completion percentage, added a little bit to the interception percentage, and Josh Allen's still quarterback one, right? And and so if you're drafting them late second, early third, maybe you hold off, maybe you get a little better value. Do we really know that, you know, I mean, until we see all the pieces there, <laughs> April one, I bet you appreciated it. That is a good April spool. Well done. Andy. Although Steve shows up in Dallas for the Scott fishbowl. So I'm just saying he does have some aspects. Um, so you look at, you know, you look at Josh Allen. I mean, I think, you know, if, if he becomes a little bit of a value, would it be a huge surprise to see some people start to value Lamar Jackson or Jalen Hurts a little bit higher than him? It would not. And, <laughs> and that this is, this is going to be the key. The, the players on hand right now at the wide receiver position. I mean, I don't see, you know, like Curtis Samuel, he's one of my favorite 20th round picks in best balls. He's not like a guy that I want to count on every week in regular redraft league. Um, I think, you know, and all due respect to Mac Hollins and, you know, and Khalil Shakir, I mean, I don't think they're frontline kind of fantasy assets, right? So they are definitely going to draft somebody. We'll see what they do. Maybe they trade for somebody. I think the cap hit on Diggs is $31 million. It's the sixth highest dead cap hit. <clears throat> I think the highest for a non-quarterback ever in the history of the league. So that does kind of tie their hands to some extent. Also tells you something about Stephon Diggs. Like, you know, and I'm not going to sit here and say I have any clues as to what's going on behind the scenes or, but I mean, I think we could all read between the lines, just watching him and over the course of his career, uh, worked his way out of Minnesota, worked his way into Buffalo, and now has worked his way out of Buffalo and on to Houston. Houston, uh, boy, did the th final three years of his contract, gave him some guaranteed money this year. He will be an unrestricted free agent next year. If, he's content and happy and adds to their team. They'll probably make a great effort to retain him. And if not, he'll be able to test the market, maybe try his hand somewhere else and see if he can find a place to peacefully coexist. I mean, like, you know, there are people who, you know, for better or worse, I mean, it's in, it's, it's football's a, it's sports in general at this level. They're super competitive and the intensity of these players bring to the table is great. Sometimes they can overdo it. And I think there's, you know, players like Diggs who, who, when they aren't, the focal point that they believe they should be, it's hard for them to deal with. We've seen it with guys like Antonio Brown. So, and not to put like two different categories, but we've seen this in the past with players. So uh, hopefully he can find a home where he's in Houston, where he's happy and they can coexist. I think for fantasy purposes, this just muddies the waters for us. On the other side, whoever the lead receiver is in Buffalo, we're going to be very interested in. I'm looking at you, Dalton Kincaid, who right now looks like the de facto wide receiver one. And it reminds me how last year we were talking about him going in. And by the way, well, I see your question, Brian, I'll get to that in a second. But Matt Waldman last year, you know, was one of the first guys who was really, really that I talked to was really high on Kincaid and didn't think it would be immediate, but thought down the stretch, he would come become a kind of a playmaking difference a playmaker and a difference maker in this offense. Maybe now we'll see that come to fruition. Right. And so, <clears throat> so, He's going around tight end six or seven. I think that's a great, great gamble. And then that's where your Dalton Schultz has come in or your Dallas Goddard or that range of player where you can wait a little later, get that second tight end that you feel fairly confident in in case it doesn't. We, I mean, like, do we see signs from Kincaid that he could be that guy? Yeah, we saw flashes. Would like to see it on a more consistent basis. Sounds like the opportunities will be there. I mentioned this on my football guys video. He could be the team leader in targets, like, you know, like a true, Travis Kelsey like presence in this offense. And if he's that, we're all getting a great, great, an awesome deal on him, right? It'd be fantastic. Uh, John loves the use. I, I agree. Da Danielle Hunter is still very good. Uh, the Vikings will miss him. Um, and uh, adding to this defense, the, the, 
the Texans are in win now mode, right? And this is the path. You see two paths for teams, right? There's the Kansas City path, which works pretty damn well. Pay your quarterback a half billion dollars and figure it out around him. Um, and it's working because Pat Mahomes is the, the quarterback. Other teams are taking the, hey, we've got a quarterback on, on the rookie contract before we're having to give him that huge mega deal. It's going to be a significant portion of our cap and limit the moves we can make at other positions and forcing some hard decisions. And, and I think we've seen teams have success with both routes. Most recently, the Chiefs have had the most success of all of them. So maybe that's telling. Maybe we'll see Houston change that, change that a little bit, right? And other teams. Then there are the Panthers. That's correct. Look, I'm, I find myself, okay, so I've, I'm doing a number of super flex drafts. And I find myself with a lot of Bryce Young. Here's why. Because I keep forgetting to get my third quarterback, and they go fast this year. I think I've been kind of spoiled in past seasons where you could get that third quarterback really late, and people were pretty content to sit there and go with their top two. And then, you know, it, it hasn't been that way. And maybe it's just the early because it's early in the year, and maybe it's the later. And some of the quarterback situations become more better resolved. But I'm getting Bryce Young because I'm not a hundred percent confident. Not a hundred percent confident in some of the. You know, like I wouldn't mind having Daniel Jones if I was sure he was going to be a starter all year. I think he will be. I think Geno Smith will be too. I don't know for sure. I mean, there's some signals coming. There's some mixed signals coming from those places. So, so Bryce Young, there are no missed sing signals, right? I know he's going to be. He's going to be playing. This is not news. Uh, so, so we'll, we'll, I'm getting a lot of Bryce Young, and I'm hoping Dave Canales, who has a history going back to well, a brief but a successful history, we can go back to Geno Smith, the reclamation project there in Seattle. He, he was a big part of, and in Tampa Bay last year with Baker Mayfield. Uh, so, I'm hoping they can figure some, some things out. But I say Dave Canales' biggest weakness is he does not get on the field and pass protect. It's going to be a problem, right? Uh, and this is not a bad pro. So a couple of things here. I want to get back to something, uh, Brian Larkin asked here before I lose track of it. Matt Waldman said on Wednesday, he had Penix as number two quarterback in this year's draft. Is he ready for first round starter? <clears throat> I think if you ask Matt Waldman, nobody should start their first. Game. That's just how he feels. Right. And I mean, obviously Caleb Williams, obviously many of them are, and possibly Michael Penix will be one of them. I think ideally he would be able to sit for a year. So you look at some of the little potential landing spots. I mean, Oakland, Oakland, Las Vegas seems to be sniffing around pretty heavily. So I'm going to have an article in this week's fantasy notebook at football guys that kind of goes into depth because I'm covering Luke Getzey's hire as the offensive coordinator. Antonio Pierce wants 24 points a game. That's why I hired Luke Getzey, who's Chicago Bears average 20 points a game. I know I don't do math, but that's not working out for me. But anyway, and also, Antonio Pierce has, has made it pretty clear that Aiden O'Connell gets first shot at this job. And so I asked Hondo Carpenter from SI.com last week if that was maybe just a little bit of lip service. I mean, they bring in Gardner Minshew. There's talking about sniffing around some of the rookie quarterbacks. I think they talked to Bo Nix. And I get doing due diligence and all. Um, Penix has kind of been gaining a little momentum here. Um but is Aiden O'Connell really the guy? Well, you look at his numbers down the stretch. And Hondo Carter Carpenter, like said, look, man, I know Antonio Pierce. I know him. And my kind of the way I framed the question to Hondo was, like, doesn't he kind of have to say that? Pierce have to say that as, you know, O'Connell's the incumbent starter. One of the reasons people, you know, seem to love him, the players seem to love him, is because he's that kind of, you know, player's coach where he would give you the benefit of the doubt there and and do things the right way, you know, locker room wise and tell O'Connell, yes, you're the guy until he gets beaten out. And Carpenter thinks that they really like Aiden O'Connell. And, you know, you look at his numbers down the stretch and they were fairly serviceable. They're going to be a run heavy team. Though. That's just all there is to it, which means the mere white people, the mere white going as a running back 30 right now, or in the third, you know, running back three, low end running back three range is, he is criminally underpriced. I'm going to have a lot of shares. He's mere white. Uh, Sigmund Bloom and Cecil Lamby talked about a little bit about, you know, about that. But I mean, look down the stretch last year when there was no Josh Jacobs, he averaged 114 yards per game from scrimmage. It's a substantial role. I don't think Alexander Madison's there to cut into it. I just don't. So 
I'm going to have a lot of, a lot of Zamir White. And he's going to be a busy guy, and we'll see what the quarterback issue the situation shapes out to be. But I do think, ideally, Brian, all these quarterbacks, not named Caleb Williams, gets, get some time. And you look at some of the quarterback needy teams, how they've set themselves up. And, you know, you can say what you want about Sam Darnold um, in Minnesota, but, you know, they have somebody who can carry them until they can get a rookie up to speed. Look, maybe they can get a rookie up to speed really fast, or maybe they'll feel the need to. Uh, and uh, and uh, New England, you know, they've set themselves up with Jacoby, Jacoby Brissett. Washington, they have not set themselves up at all. It's not, not going to be the guys they have there, so they need to do something quickly. So we'll see. Someone's, you know, I, I'm pretty. I think it's pretty safe to say a rookie will start in Washington year one as well. So we'll have to see where landing spots are. I'll know that starting April 25th. 26th, 25th is correct. Um, more questions. I hope when things retires, he does it at halftime, but by whatever show to sing, then jumping into the sand is high fives about it. I liked all the memes of, you know, the Antonio Brown memes were prevalent when, you know, the, the first time Nico Collins or Tank Dell scores a touch, the Antonio Brown meltdown and New York. Uh, Dame looking to sell high. I, I think that's a fair way to leverage it. Uh, 112 and 211, yes. I would, I would accept that in this year's draft. I'm just doing a super flex draft right now. Um, I'll tell you how it's going. Uh, we draft the <laughs> Darnold is, tw yeah, Darnold is a little older than 23. Um, is he 26? I'll let y'all fact check. Fact check. What is Sam Darnold? Yeah, he's 26. Seems like he's 23 because he's a very handsome young man. Um, I think that, you know, the thing with Darnold, you know, and I know Kevin O'Connell said this and I kind of mocked it in a video last week. And, and it wasn't really mocking, but, you know, like they, they think Sam Darnold's best football is ahead of him. And it has to be because he hasn't been great. You think about a quarterback who's been really defined by a single game and a single comment I'm seeing out there, right? That game against the Patriots. You know, he's, he'll never he'll never shake that. I believe it was a coach who kind of, you know, put that out there thinking he was helping him. And, it, you know, that's just a bad taste. So we'll see. Kevin O'Connell, I have a pretty, pretty reasonable amount of faith in him cobbling some things together. Look what they did last year with nobody a quarterback, right? For the period of time that they had nobody. I mean, it's not like they weren't, you know, running a reasonable offense at that point. So I'm kind of excited. Uh, I think that's, you know, the that's the hope, obviously. The next, you know, Mayfield and then the Vikings, that would be great. Uh, but the Vikings are going to draft. I think this is a great deal. Let me tell you what's going on in the super flex that I'm in right now. I'll totally name drop too. Matthew Berry had the first pick overall, Marvin Harrison Jr. This is a super flex. Grant Barfield took Caleb Williams. Evan Silva took Jaden Daniels. Pat Thorman had two picks, Drake May and Malik Neighbors. That's going to be hard to contend with. Danny Kelly took Roma Dunze. Barfield took Brock Bowers. Davis Maddock took uh, Brian Thompson Jr. Uh, I made a trade here. I wanted Xavier Worthy at 109. Uh, Scott Barrett, TJ Calkins came up and made me an offer. I only had two picks in this draft, so I traded up one pick and added a pick in the fourth round. Uh, they took JJ McCarthy. I'm loaded at quarterback. Josh Allen, Jordan Love, Derek Carr, and others that are, you know, at least multiple starters. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Xavier Worthy then fell to me at 110, and that's where I ended up. Uh, Dynasty Trades AQ took Troy Franklin. Davis Maddox took uh, Adney Mitchell, AD, I think is the easy way. And then Barry took a uh, lab McConkey. So that's kind of the, uh, you know, going through the top 10 picks in a super flex. I think you're going to see, you know, a lot of receivers going off and there's a lot of receivers I'm fairly confident in. He had to have six rushing touchdowns. Panthers can only run block. It's like been how many years now? They need to figure that out. I did make a move. Tried to make another move. Tried to, uh, tried to add a frontline receiver. Uh, trading with Barrett, uh, offered him, but uh, I wanted Michael Pittman. And at some point, I'm going to try and make a move for Anthony Richardson. In this league. I don't know if I have the firepower now that Josh Allen is uh, is without Stephon Diggs. I might have to be a, be a little more patient with this. Uh, really happy that Jordan loves panning out. 
but uh, wanted to set myself up for a future combo. I tried to land Pittman with uh, what, what I offer. Uh, it was close, but I think if this had been not a super point, I would have got it. They they wanted some things that I didn't want to give up. So anyway, um, I remember what I gave. What did the offer still up? I thought it was a fair offer. It was probably a more fair offer. I offered my 2024. I offered him 110 uh, and two fourths for Pittman. And I think if this was a regular league, that might have flown, but probably not in a super flex. So you know. I thought it was a pretty reasonable offer, though. And they're loaded at wide receivers, so that made a difference, too. I mean, like, loaded. Like, Michael Pittman is going to have a hard time making their starting lineup. E. Higgins could have gone for it there as well, but uh, would have have that Anthony Richards thing in my head pretty pretty hard. Um, but I, so that, that was, you know, to say, Dame, that I think, you know, looking at how leagues are going to play out, I think there's receiving assets – that I feel pretty comfortable with down. Like, do I like Hollywood? Yes. I think he's in a good spot. I think he's going to, you know, rise up and I think he's defined himself. Availability has been an issue for him throughout. So, uh, so yeah, I think that's a good deal. I, I would take that. I would not not take that. John Bonneville made a list of teams that are probably drafting running backs. Raiders were one of them. I, th I think that's, like, fair, but I think Samir White's the guy there. Um, the other teams, Cardinals, Cowboys for sure, Chargers for sure, uh, Cardinals for sure, Giants for sure, Raiders I think yes, Pats I think probably, Panthers for sure, Browns for sure, Vikings yes for sure. I see all those teams making those moves. So I, and I guess you know the only question is the level. I think the Cowboys and Chargers are going to invest – you know, fairly early, not first round. You know, um, see a lot of people hoping Jonathan Brooks ends up there. I hope, you know, that's a great landing spot. I just, you know, I think that kind of, you know, expectations for this year should be based on the fact that he had four an ACL in November, right? And players coming off the ACL, look, it's, a mix, it's been a mixed bag and mostly mixed not in a great way. So uh, I wouldn't get, a, I'm not over enthusiastic about that. <clears throat> I know, listen to my colleagues at Football Guys, listen to Jeff Bell and Kevin Coleman and Christian Williams have a video out about the uh, running back class being underrated. But there were some mixed opinions there, and it was a really good listen and kind of helped me sort things out, of course, in my rookie scouting portfolio. Matt Waldman likes a lot of guys. We discussed it. If you missed it, watch uh, Wednesdays, watch the replay. Uh, he has some guys on in the rookie scouting portfolio that are, you know, some interesting names that not everyone has. I will throw some of them out to you. I don't like to give away all Matt's work, but. I will discuss um, because I think it's interesting. He has Brooks at the top of his class, Blake Corum right there. Trey Benson is a guy that I'm really interested in. Once he ran, once you run fast, I'm a sucker. I can't stop. Jalen Wright also very fast, but kind of a looks more like a bit player. But some of the other names that he had here, Dylan Johnson, Monty Vidal. I think Will Shipley's a guy that I'm seeing gain a little buzz as well. Dylan Lowby, Blake Watson. That's a guy that a lot of people like out of Memphis. Ray Davis, Matt likes. Braylon Allen seems like a good contributing factor. Uh, my buddy Hutch uh, over at Football Guys, Hutch the Brown. Uh, Kendall Milton the third out of Georgia is a player he likes an awful lot. Otter guessed me, kind of the mysterious things. Matt is low on Marshawn Lloyd. Other people are really high on him. So <clears throat> we'll have to see how some of the, you know, for me, running back is a lot more about landing spot than talent. Like these guys are fairly talented, but, but the landing spot, so immediate role they're going to get, those things are going to going to matter. And so uh, so I think that, you know, that's why, you know, like I'm doing a dynasty draft right now before the NFL draft that has a layer of intrigue that's hard to deal with. But it's mostly quarterbacks and receivers. I mean, you're drafting the talent. It's like it almost simplifies a little bit. Because uh, I think with running backs, then you start have to, you know, with running backs after the draft, you have to start factoring in the scheme. Is it a gap zone? Is that what they excel at? Is it a competition? Do they have a clear path to workload? These are the things I'm drafting a running back. I'm drafting, if there's a checklist, clear path to workload, followed by clear path to workload, followed by clear path to workload, and other things. Right? That's what I'm after. So I really want to wait on the running backs if I can. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, we've been, I've been drafting a lot. 
drafting a lot. And that league is really good because, you know, and I mean, it's, it is, it is also name dropping, but they're, you know, it's cool to, you know, draft with some of these guys that are at the higher end of the, the stratosphere here. And I'm kind of like the, 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 the low man on the totem pole and kind of battling with this group. So it's a lot of fun. Uh, I feel like I must agree with you. I ordered the guys we're going in. I, I thought it was pretty fairly predictable. Uh, you know, I think worthy is a little bit of a dark toss, uh, Jay, but a very fast dart. So I'll go ahead and throw it. Jalen Wright and Kamari Vidal are great in pass protection. That should be the other great point, John. This should be the thing that you look for first and foremost. I mentioned earlier that teams take various paths to success. One of those paths is paying your quarterback all the money you have. When you pay all the quarterback all the money you have, pass protection becomes even more vital. When a rookie running back comes in and he is uh, well versed as a pass protector, that works out really well. It works, works in his favor, right? That's it's it's critical. If you cannot demonstrate the ability to, uh, <laughs> if you can't demonstrate the ability to protect the passer in the NFL, you're not going to be around very long. And I mean, this goes back to we can all remember Lawrence Hill, boy. Uh, whiffing on Aeneas Williams and essentially ending Steve Young's career on a Monday night in Arizona. Right. I mean, it's just like, this is, and I think, I think that was a defining moment for running backs in the NFL. So you have to be able to pass protect. And so these guys are great. Now, really well pass protectors definitely to me have an edge. Uh, and I would agree with that. And I, I agree with Roshan last year, but Bears didn't throw that much. And and also agree there. Uh, this is this is perfectly true too. And like guys can improve at this too. Like if you come into the league and you're not great at that, okay, get better at it. Coaching helps there. And we've seen players. Caleb Miller was a guy who came into the league and could not pass protect. And by the time he left, he was right up at, with anybody as a pass blocker at the running back position. So <clears throat> so yes, totally agree with all those things. All right, so a couple other stories of interest here that I thought were big. Uh, the Ravens talking about their revamped rushing attack. And, yes, I'm just going through some of the stories that I talked about in my Football Guys video. comes out every Friday now. Uh, the Weekend News is like a 10-minute quick review. Kind of gives a little context to some of the top stories. If you weren't paying attention during the week, it's very useful. By the way, if you just did, I'm Bob Harris. Hi, how are you? Damn glad you're here. Um, you find my work at footballguys.com. Only with football diehards, we're on the football diehards YouTube channel. This is kind of my personal show to come out here and have a little fun. I'll be doing more and more things on the football guys channel and doing more work. It's my fantasy notebook goes out in the email list. If you don't get the email, go to football guys, sign up. It's free. You can unsubscribe at any time, but you get great content in your inbox every day for free and it's super fantastic and very useful. And then you can subscribe to the content at the site. Tons of tons of great staffers and uh, tools, all the things you need to the rankings. Etc. Etc. You can also hear me every Saturday at this time of year on Sirius XM Fantasy Sports Radio, the Football Diehards Radio Program with Mike Dempsey, who is IMing me links to uh, to our best balls for today. So we'll be starting up some best balls. So jump in the best ball room if you get a chance with us. We love playing, and we play a number of them. We usually start two leagues a week. Uh, the shows will pick up, I believe, this year in July. We'll start going to multiple shows a week. Um, we'll have multiple shows the week of the drafts. I think we'll be doing a Wednesday night special through draft. Uh, our draft coverage, I'll be part of Thursday night. I'll be doing reaction videos probably on the uh, Twitter feed, the X feed, the channel. And I'll be appearing on the show. Uh, Saturday night, I'll be doing a, or Friday night, I'll be doing a wrap up show, like 11 to 1 solo show. Probably have Waldman on, maybe John Lobb. We'll discuss some of the landing spots. Um, Thursday, Saturday, it's Friday night, 11 to 1. Saturday, 4 to 7, Dempsey and I will be on kind of around at the draft. Then Sunday afternoon, we'll do the, we'll host the post draft draft. Yeah, that was a, so yes, and then we get a lot of good information. Uh, by the way, Cecil Lammy's very well connected to the league. So a lot of times, you know, and I, that's a fair one. The connection is obvious, but, uh, and that was that was an interesting interesting thing. Like, what happened to Zach Evans? We don't know. We, we can't figure it out either. So that's something to watch a little bit. Like, I'm in on Tyron Williams, but I am mindful of the fact that, uh, you know, Cam Akers 
went from running back two down the stretch last year to unemployed and nothing. Flat. There's more to that story that we don't know. I think uh, Scampers, Dame, do we know that story any more than we know the whole Stetson Bennett story? I don't think we've. I don't think we've heard the whole accounting. By the way, did we see uh, Aaron Donalds talking about Puka Nakua? What were the comments? There were some quotes from Aaron Donald thinks highly of Puka Nakua. We'll go with that. What what is this quote? You see a, it's a little give him that's camp. I'm one of those guys who got to show me during game time from the first game. He was consistent. Then the Colts game, we ended up going overtime. We ended up making the game winning touchdown for us. Love it. In my opinion, to be honest with you, for any position, me personally watching, that's one of the best rookie performances from any position that I got the opportunity to watch. He said that about Cooper. I accidentally drafted Cooper Cup in the league, and I feel really bad about it. This was my number one. Wide receiver last year. I'm just going, man, Puka Nuku has killed my guy. Hopefully not. Hopefully the price is low enough that I'll feel okay about it. At the very least, yes. Validated. Evans does not suck. Sometimes it's a process. Maybe pass protection was an issue. That, that's a, so, yeah. So in the videos, I was, I was thinking that myself. And I'm going to be on the road in a hotel. Uh, so... So we'll, we'll have to sort that out. But I, I was thinking that very thing. I think last couple of years I've been doing those videos and it's been pretty light duty, right? Like easy money. Uh, this year I'm going to earn my keep. Yeah, no idea about it. Yeah. yeah it's, I mean, you know, obviously there were issues going on. And, and I suspect some of it, like, who was, who was the other guy uh, that was having some issues? Who's moved around a couple of teams? Was it with Arizona, then went to New Orleans? <sighs> Why is it escaping me? We just had, you know, trouble coming to grips with the fact that he's not playing a, a major or a more prominent role, let's say. And that's why he doesn't stick around places very long. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see what's up with I think he's probably some glass can makers after his latest injury. But, but I, I'm interested to see what happens because, I mean, like the Rams have shown, Sean McVay has shown he's more than willing to make that shift <laughs> when the time is right. Maybe the time is right. Uh, we'll see about all that. But anyway, so lots of draft coverage coming up for me and uh, all diehards on Sirius XM Fantasy Sports Radio and Sirius XM Fantasy Sports Radio in general. And I think the last couple of years, we've cranked up the show a little more in August. I think it's going to crank up a little sooner this year. So feel yourselves for that. Um, and then tons of stuff going on football, guys. I think that the weekly news video will become more than weekly at some point soon. And I'll start doing more news there. And I'll get my rankings in there, too. I know you're all waiting patiently or not. I'll get to it. Uh, Daryl Henderson was another one, right? I mean, they just like, they seem to run through these guys. Um, I'm going to look for something. Like that. Who is the, might still be on the Saints practice squad. Practice squad, practice, yeah, they don't. They don't list it. I wish I could find it. I wish I could remember who it was because there was a player who's definitely like moved around to a couple teams and just doesn't seem to get along. Because 49ers have CMC and Mitchell hit, people forget they whiffed on third rounders like two, three years in a row. Trey Sermon would like to know that wasn't a whiff, that that was the other circumstances were involved. Uh, Trey Sermon's still in Philadelphia. No, he's in Indianapolis now. You got to keep track of these guys. They move around a lot. But yeah, like running backs or, you know, I mean, like every position. Sir. I think one of the things that, you know, like I know everyone loves a draft. John Bonneville maybe loves it more than anyone else here. But <clears throat> part of what I don't like about it is 99% of everything I hear right now is not going to happen or is untrue. I, uh, like, and I'm used to it, like we're all grown up adults. We know everyone's lying to us, right? But the line ramps up leading up to the draft <clears throat> and and also like you know like every player can only go to one team they're not going to play for multiple teams so all the discussion we're having about you know is you know some great percentage but it's going to go for not and i get it it's enjoyable and the speculation is all fun and beautiful. <clears throat> but man it really feels good when they get a helmet on and i know where the hell they are so we can quit all the well if no we can say now that Exactly right, John. It's, it, it is, to me, just like 
the craziness. And, and also, like, even though I'm drafting right now, and, and I want to say, how many drafts? Is it? It's a lot of drafts. Not as many as Mike Dempsey. Mike Dempsey is well over 100 drafts already. I'm not doing that. I just have no interest in drafting 13 teams at a time at this point of the year. <laughs> I'm well up. I'm heading close to 30, right? And I think that's a, you know, couple of three, four going on at any one time because you do want to be up to speed and kind of in the mood, you know, in the flow of things and kind of have a good understanding when you're sitting here talking about things kind of contemporaneously and be able to say, oh, yeah, I'm gra grabbing him in this round or that round. Or he's sliding or he's falling, falling. And you can kind of get a feel for how instant reactions are to news like on Diggs and or, or you know, or she writes, how, you know, how people are reacting to it in the moment only to know that that's going to ramp up as we get closer to the season and there are actual developments that are going to happen in real time. Not that this is an actual development, it's a huge development. <clears throat> and uh, these ADP changing moves, though, uh, how fast people are going to react and how fast you need to react to be able to leverage them to your advantage. Um, <clears throat> so one of the other stories that I talked about this week that I thought was interesting uh, was the running attack. I think Still, Derrick Henry is going way too low, the running back in Baltimore. <clears throat> Lamar Jackson is still going to run. Is he going to throw more? Maybe. A lot more? Probably not. But Derrick Henry is going to run a ton. And Derrick Henry, by the way, is still very good. I know that there's people out there who perceive he's been sliding. I talked about it in an article I did a couple weeks ago and mentioned again in the video last week. Sixth highest breakaway run rate in the NFL last year. I uh, had the seventh fastest speed in the NFL last year he can still play and he's working behind an upgraded offensive line. Remember the Tennessee's offensive line last year ranked, what I want to say in the bottom, I want to say the bottom third, but it might be the bottom two or three in terms of one blocking. They're horrible. I think it'll get better this year, but um, it's a great situation for Derrick Henry. And they say they're not going to do it. A lot of RPOs, not as many run pass options. I would like to see more of those. I'm trying to imagine the difficulties that opposing defenders will have trying to make decisions. At the mesh point there. It was Eno Benjamin. Who said that first? Did you say that first? That's the guy, man. He cannot stand that play. That's, no, that's the one. Uh, I'm not going to rival not just my rankings every day in the training camp based on random clips of one rep. Man, that is the, that is the that is the battle. That is defining the scampers was down the rabbit hole. Thank you, scampers. Much appreciated. You know, Benjamin, man. Like, he has a very high opinion of himself. I've heard from people, you know, in multiple locations that that is the issue. He does not kindly to not being the guy. And he's never been the guy. And uh, I don't know that there's any evidence that he's capable of being the guy other than him believing that he is that guy. He has a hard time holding on to his job. This is critical, though. What, what John Bonneville said. Don't adjust. So the minute by minute, that's the thing. And that's why we're having these discussions this time of year. This is how we look at this. It's a data continuum. It's a line of information that you're going to be plugging pieces in. And we started right after the Super Bowl, right? Immediately. We started drafting. We started talking. We started following what the, the, the important, the, the decision makers are saying and trying to sort through it. And part of doing that is plugging in more information as we go along <clears throat> and comparing what's happening to what was said and figuring out the differences and looking for shifts and changes that can help inform our rankings. But all of these should be taken into context that it's not a single thing. It's no one thing. We need to quit doing that. We, we need to quit turning multivariable equations into single variable equations. We look at a single thing like Stefan Diggs, for example, and I don't know that it's untrue, it, Joe Brady becoming offensive coordinator didn't have a huge impact on his outcome last year. I don't know that it was the only thing that had an impact on his outcome that year, but that's how people look at it, right? Or we look at, you know, we, we want to cast things in black or white, this or that, because it's easier for us to process. Nothing is that easy. It's that simple. Everything needs to be looked at with a more nuanced eye and accepting the very, you know, the various tips. And that's part of the fun of this game, right? But changing your rankings or how you view a player on a single piece of information is the wrong approach. John Bonneville is right. So welcome. Welcome, BCP. Uh, we're here to help you learn that. 
Uh, and that's the other thing you'll find here if you're new to this channel or my work or our work at Football Diehards or at Football Guys. Joe Bryan over at Football Guys will tell you all the time, guys, we're here to help you. Like it's your team. You get to make all the decisions. You get to decide how things work. I'm here to decide, help you. You know, I'm here to show you, hey, look, this is how I've done it over the course of time. Here's the levels of success or not. I, right? And that's part of the learning process. I'm wrong a lot. How do I adjust? How do I adapt and overcome those setbacks? That's part of the fun and part of the process. You're going to love it, BC Beastly. Uh, we're now for life. Thank you, Dan. Hey, Jim Perry. Good to see you here. So, yeah, so back to Henry. Henry's going still in the third or fourth round. I'm going to have a ton of Henry before all is said and done because I can't not. Uh, Raheem Mostert also got a contract extension. Uh, that tells us what? That he's going to be around for at least this year or, or whatever. You know, he's extended in 2025. Okay. Maybe he plays that extension. Maybe not. But he is going to play in 2024. He's 32 years old. Also, one of the fastest players in the NFL, slightly faster than Derrick Henry. I put this out in the video. He ran a 21.68 miles per hour last year. Or, yes, 21.62. Uh, Devon A. Chan, 21.98. Tyreek 22.01. They are all within a half mile an hour each other. Nobody's catching anybody there from behind. Um, but the point is, is, I'm seeing Devon A. Chan, and I got an argument on the YouTube comments with someone. I said my, my premise here is, you know, we're doing this wrong. If you're drafting Devon Achan as running back eight in round two, when Raheem Mostert is available at, in round eight as running back 27, you're missing some opportunity costs here. So, like, I'm not saying Achan can't be good. I don't even know that I'm saying that he's not going to have the lead role. My argument is Raheem Mostert's not going away. And, oh, he scored 18 rushing touchdowns last year, 21 total touchdowns. It was a big part of this offense, a bigger part. Ran for over 1,000 yards. His availability was slightly better than A-chan. We'll see. But, I mean, you know, the price matters too, right? And that's something in DCB League you're going to find, uh, you're, you're going to hear us talk about a lot here, is, is value, right? When can you get players versus what you expect to get? I mean, there are guys you have to draft at their ceiling. I don't know that Devin, Devon A-chan is one of those players you have to draft at a ceiling. Yet that's where he's being drafted. We're expecting him to be the frontline player or the people who are drafting him as a running back one, running back eight on underdog. And, you know, is that in his range of possible outcomes? Absolutely. Is it the most likely end of that range? I don't think so. I mean, <laughs> and, the, and by golly, the Dolphins just told us they don't think so either because they gave Raheem Mostert $9 million uh, to stick around. So, you know, when when don't teams lie? Teams don't lie when they're spending cash and Bernie draft capital. That's when they're telling you what they're playing. And they just told us that with Raheem Mostert. So like not not you know not slogging or slagging or you know downplaying what HN's abilities are, just looking at the value of what we're getting or what our expectations be for the price we're paying. You need to take that into account when you're drafting. Pounded the table so hard. <laughs> right. That, and sometimes that's how it works. Running back is that position, though. It's the most volatile positions. Last year, that was the thing about last year. I was, and here's the approach I often take. I'm buying the cheapest component of a group of players that are priced in the same range. Follow the money, even if it's paid to Miles Sanders. Ah, damn it. Yes true i mean you know that is it is true and i mean it, it's it's and this is just to show you that developments can change the way things work right you just can't lie with their transactions that is a fact and they don't lie they lie to you all the rest of the time so <laughs> this is the miles sanders stuff. miles sanders is a weird is a weird one though. i mean it's it's hard to understand I uh, think back to his rookie year in Philadelphia where he was like the major playmaker in that offense. Granted, he had a ton of injuries. And that was both as a runner and receiver. And just as here's another lesson we should have learned. And I don't know if it's going to make it into this week's notebook or not, but I was writing about Jordan Love a little bit. And you all know how I stand, or the regular people know how I stand on Jordan Love. We should have known. We should have known something about Jordan Love. Why? 
because the Packers let a four-time MVP walk out the door. Uh, no matter how acrimonious the relationship is with Aaron Rodgers, do you let that guy leave if you don't think you have a reasonable alternative? I mean, if you're a responsible organization, and I think the Packers have proven to be that over the course of time. I mean, whatever you think of Packers, I mean, they're not a bunch of foes, right? So, uh, so we should have seen, or we should have had, at least had an idea that somebody there thinks, and, and this goes to tell us something about Miles Sanders, right? What we perceive of players, we're seeing a tip, tiny tip of the iceberg, right? We see it two hours on, three hours on Sunday, of which we see maybe 10 minutes of a single player, right? Like, you know, brief flashing moments. Uh, for a given player. And the team is around him all day, every day, year round. They know a lot more about him. They understand things that we don't understand. They see issues that we don't necessarily see because probably they're, you know, not hiding the issues, but they're not throwing that player into positions of weakness, right? Where they they can't excel. Maybe there's more of those positions for Miles Sanders that we realize. And maybe it turns out that, that rookie season was more of a clue. And yes, the money did work for Christian Kirk. Hopefully it works again this year. We'll see who, who else uh, they end up with wide receivers there. Um, yeah, I did want to get that in about the, uh, the, 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 the assessment of players. I, th- I thought that was interesting with Jordan Love last year. I know, by the way, I talked to you this week and he seems to be doing quite well, if any of you were wondering. Um, uh, he was all in on Love last year. And, and, and I think part of our discussions about him as we were working through our rankings, et cetera, was that, was my argument is, man, the Packers are all in on this. I mean, better or worse, they think they have something. Well, if you think a team is competent, like we don't think all of them are, right? I mean, I get it. But I feel like the Packers are at least competent. I, and I think there are a number of organizations where I trust organizationally uh, they'll get the job done. By the way, I should have asked earlier, is my sound okay? I'm still like worried. Last week's Ask Me Anything, the replay, the sound is almost unlistenable. But I hope it wasn't that bad while I was talking. I hope it's better now. Um, all right, my guy. Great article on Justin Fields, by the way, footballguys.com website. Uh, Zari looks at the things that limited Justin Fields over the course of his time in Chicago. Facts. Uh, <laughs> holding the ball too long. Thank you, Dane. Appreciate that. Um, that, you know, and just like kind of takes a look. Going forward, is there hope, reasons we can believe he, we can improve? So go read that article. Great article. Sorry, we'll be on soon on the uh, on the hot seat. I can assure you that there will be no escape. All right, so we're down to the last couple minutes. Was there any other stories of the Christian Watson thing? This uh, I, I wanted to lead into that. The price is paid, right? So very interesting. You look at the prices right now for the Packers wide receivers. Jaden Reed is top guy at right around 40, 39. Then you go down Romeo Dubs a little after that, Christian Watson. And the point of my story this week was Watson's going to uh, some kind of medical lab and trying to sort out the issues with his hamstring. He does that. If he turns back into that guy we saw the seven touchdown, four game stretch as a rookie, he's going to be a great value as like wide receiver 54 right now. I'm going to have a ton of Dontavian Wicks because I'm buying the cheapest piece in a lot of cases. And I think that's something you know you should be considering as you look at these situations. And it wraps me back around to Miami last year. Ron Achan was going as, I want to say, running back 48. Mostert was going as running back 50-ish. Jeff Wilson Jr. was going like running back 54. Yes, sadly, I had a lot of Jeff Wilson Jr. because I bought the cheapest. But you see the theory. If there are a group of guys closer together, and any of them, especially in best ball, any given Sunday, can rise up and give you good numbers, it's not a bad approach. Not as good of an approach in season long. right? You, you need to adjust that. And we'll... Talk about that more as we get closer to season. All the good stuff. So I'll pull today. Uh, Love versus Stroud and Dynasty. I thought it was interesting. That the majority leads down. I'm betting the majority leads Stroud. Part of that is having, you know, Bobby Sloak as your coordinator. I mean, you know, look, Matt LaFleur's offense is, I think, highly underrated. I think Matt LaFleur, when you watch Packers games, he does a fantastic job of setting up opposing defenses you know, like fainting and like really, you know, running a bunch of a series of plays and then running a play counter to that, that, 
you know, defense is looking the other way. He does a great job of all that. I uh, really appreciate that. I think that's one of the things that's working in Love's flavor, but so is Bobby Slowick. No doubt about it. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Appreciate y'all. Andrea, appreciate you coming. I hope you have a uh, great day, and I hope you continue healing up and getting better, and uh, holler if you need anything. John Bonneville probably leaves love because Loic is – I, I should have brought that up because I think that's a totally fair point. Uh, and that is kind of one of the reasons, you know, in Green Bay, why you look at the coaches that are the play callers. I think Cincinnati, you can look at that. Los Angeles, you can look at that. Now Tennessee, you can look at that. And uh, I want to say, for me, a little bit, uh, the Indy Colts was being psyched. And we'll see if uh, Doug Peterson continues that. Maybe he's not doing that great job. But I think that is a factor that you should pay attention to in Dynasty because uh, it does make a difference when the coordinators, especially coordinators on the rise, like Bobby Slowick in Houston. So there we have it. All right, everybody, catch me on the radio in a couple hours, three to five. Me and Mike Dempsey will be starting up some best balls at that particular point in time. That you can get in on. Thank you, Michael Kubiak. I will have a great day. Thank you, Scampers. Appreciate that. Everyone have a good time. So see you on the radio later. Back here Wednesday at 7 p.m. Watch for my fantasy notebook coming out in the Football Guys Daily Email Sunday night on the site. Monday is free, by the way. They don't charge you. You don't have to have a subscription to read that entire thing. It's a monster. I'll see you then. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Over and out.